Last month, three more members of the Hatton Garden gang were found guilty of their roles in the record-breaking heist. But one, Basil, is still on the run. We'll speak to the head of the flying squad, Detective Superintendent Craig Turner, about the latest in their hunt for Basil shortly. But first, the inside story of how the rest of the gang were caught. It's the biggest burglary in British history. There were career criminals. This was one last hurrah for them to, to, to undertake. £14 million pounds worth of jewellery, gemstones and gold stolen from the heart of the UK diamond industry. You can compare it with, um, with old boxers, you know, they retire, but they get an offer to go back in the ring one more time. And this was a big price. They would see themselves at the, the top end of criminality. The flying squad is at the top end of police investigation. On Tuesday, the 7th of April, following the Easter weekend, security guards at the Hatton Garden Safe Deposit Company arrived for work. What they discovered would trigger a major investigation by the elite flying squad. It was a burglar in Hatton Garden. It was, it was going to be high value. And so we decided straight away, yes, we take it, get down there, assess it, and then we'll develop it from there. You know, within a few hours, it became apparent that it was a really serious crime and that it's definitely a job for us. The scale of what the thieves had got away with made headlines around the world. The flying squad were in the spotlight. We have to hit the ground running. A lot of these victims, it was clear early on, were going to be significantly financially affected by this. So straight away, there is the pressure the vast majority of people who stored property in the vault were traders in London's jewellery quarter, with much of their wealth tied up in goods. I have been through the door every single day of certainly three or four times a week for 45 years. It was quite a big part of my pension that was sitting in there, or had been sitting in there, which was now gone. The Hatton Garden investigation was a classic case of cops and robbers. Within the first day, uh, we'd already um, brought together a, a team of officers to uh, trawl CCTV in the area. They painstakingly built up a picture of how the heist happened. The gang were caught on CCTV arriving at around 7 p.m. in this white van. Then at 9.22 p.m., a mysterious red-haired man gained access to the building. To this day, it's not known exactly how he did it. Once inside, he opened the fire escape, letting the others with their builders' outfits and wheelie bins into the building. The gang then disabled the lift, allowing them to access the shaft with a clear drop straight down into the basement. It's thought the two fittest of the gang then scrambled down. Come on, they got through other security measures to let the rest of the gang in. And soon, all that was between them and the loot was the vault door and a concrete wall, half a metre thick and reinforced with steel. To access the diamonds, they used a diamond, a specialist diamond-tipped high-powered coring drill designed to penetrate concrete and stone. Come on, let's get it on the wall. Then let's get cracking. They made a hole. 25 centimetres by 45 centimetres in the wall. Just big enough for a small person to squeeze through. But they faced yet another obstacle. The back of the safe deposit boxes were bolted to the ceiling and floor and were blocking the hole and their way in. 
the hydraulic ram they bored to shift them broke. After almost 11 hours, they gave up and left at around 8 a.m., empty-handed. To walk away from that prize when you're, when you're so close, very, very difficult, very difficult in, indeed. But by the same token, the longer they're in the vault, the longer they're actually on the premises, then the chances of getting caught is raised considerably. But the gang broke one of the basic rules of the criminal world by returning the following night to the scene of the crime. Using a new hydraulic ram, they were able to dislodge the metal cabinet blocking the hole. They were finally in. The hole would have been a tight squeeze. It's thought only the two who'd scrambled down the lift shaft, including the red-haired man, actually entered the vault. Once inside, they forced open 73 safety deposit boxes, filling bags and even wheelie bins with jewels, gold, precious stones and cash. They loaded up their loot and hauled it up the stairs, leaving via the fire escape. This is the moment they made their getaway with the incredible 14 million pound haul. The flying squad had the crooks in action, but who were they? Their big break in identifying them would come as a result of the thieves' critical decision to return to the crime scene that second time. That gives us a breakthrough because it led the um, CCTV officers to identify that um, on the second night they'd arrived in a Mercedes earlier. As well as the van, the gang also used this Mercedes. Detectives were able to trace it to 74-year-old John Kenny Collins. John Collins uh, has been convicted of robbery on two occasions. Second occasion, it was armed robbery on a jeweler's. He has got a significant criminal pedigree. He wrecked Hatton Garden to check out the premises. He was also the all-important getaway driver. Because John Collins was using his own vehicle, it was a Mercedes E200, very distinctive um, and very few of them on the road. It had a black roof, black wheels, and so even the grainy CCTV that probably normally wouldn't be of, of a high evidential value uh, identified and we were able to track that car. You just got to wait until you get something that is concrete and tangible and you know is a good start point, which is what the Mercedes and Collins was, and then you commit your resources down that line. The flying squad put Collins under surveillance. He quickly led them to other members of the gang. Covert officers captured him meeting with 76-year-old Brian Reader. He's been described as the governor, the master, uh, the organiser. He's a career criminal. He would see himself at the top of the tree in this group. Reader was planning the heist as early as 2012, but didn't return to the vault on that second night. Detectives were watching as they met in cafes and pubs. The group were coming together. It was now a, a, a game, a patience game on our part. Um, and that paid off when John Collins, Brian Reader, and um, Terence Perkins met. 67 year old Terence Perkins was responsible for the drilling. He's also got form and served 22 years in prison. Perkins and Collins were telling Brian Reader when they went back how they were successful in the end. Detectives soon pieced together who the other gang members were. Daniel Jones is again uh, an organised criminal. He's younger, fitter, and that's what he brings to the group. It's believed he climbed down the lift shaft and squeezed through the hole into the vault. Carl Wood was also part of planning the heist and there on the first night, but he pulled out on the second day when he's thought to have bottled it. And then there's the red-haired man the gang referred to as Basil. 
a mysterious character. His true identity is still unknown. As detectives identified the gang members, they also planted electronic listening bugs on two of their cars, including Colin's Mercedes. It is a tactic that is used in serious crime investigations and can be quite productive. Uh, and obviously it was very productive on this occasion. We were able to obtain recordings of their conversations and we know that they were quite excited about the fact that they'd got away with such a large scale offence and it was unlikely that the police would have any idea of what had taken place or who to look for and they were quite comfortable in the fact that they were away scot-free. The man couldn't help boasting, totally unaware, the police were listening to every word. The audio recordings of the conversation which told us exactly how they'd done it, who they'd done it with, uh, how they're going to sort out the property. So for us, obviously, it was a gold mine of um, evidence. Six weeks after the heist, members of the gang met in a pub car park in North London to move some of the loot. It'd be one thing to arrest the group together, but what we wanted was property. This was the moment the three bags containing diamonds, watches and necklaces were shifted from a taxi into Colin's Mercedes. The three bags that had been exchanged behind uh, the, the pub contained at this point uh, an estimated two to four million pounds worth of diamonds and gold. With the exchange done, Collins and Jones drove in the distinctive Mercedes to a nearby property with the flying squad on their tail. We had weeks of surveillance showing the principals meeting up. We had the audio recording saying what they'd done and how they were going to do it. And eventually we had some property coming out of the woodwork. So at that point, we've got sufficient there. There'd be no reason to delay the rest any longer. So uh, that was why we made a decision at that point to go in. The police made their move. In coordinated raids with more than 200 officers, they hit 12 addresses in London and Kent. They were surprised, obviously very disappointed. They would still have been, no doubt, actively in their minds trying to work out how they're going to minimise their criminal responsibility. It's not until they're interviewed and they obviously will walk through the evidence that we had against them that they realised how comprehensive the investigation had been against them and the amount of trouble that they were in at that point in time. But they weren't saying much in police interviews. Were you a driller? No comment. Were you the person that could deactivate the lift shafts? No comment. The alarm systems? <clears throat> no comment. Was it you that messed up? No comment. It was your role, wasn't it, to um, get through the hole? No comment. Jones and the three other ringleaders, Reader, Collins and Perkins, saw the writing on the wall and confessed. To have four who spent three years in the planning for this offence to plead before going to trial basically shows, and is rewarding enough for us to say, we've done the right job and we're starting to do the right thing for the victims. From his cell at Belmarsh Prison, Danny Jones offered to give up his stash of the loot, claiming he wanted to go straight. He said he'd hidden it at Edmonton Cemetery in North London. Police searched a grave, digging for around two hours, uncovering jewellery and precious stones. A week later, they returned, this time taking Jones from his cell. He led them to a different grave. He was unaware police had already discovered the first larger hall. The flying squad had recovered some of the stolen property and they had their four ringleaders. Another three men had also been charged. They pleaded not guilty and went on trial. Last month, the jury delivered its verdict. Carl Wood and William Lincoln 
were both convicted for their roles in the burglary and for dealing with the hall. Another man, Hugh Doyle, was found guilty of helping the gang distribute the loot. The guilty men are now serving time. Well, all except one, that is. The mysterious red-haired man, Basil, or whatever his real name is, seems to have got away with it, for now. He's still out there somewhere, along with 10 million pounds of missing loot. Well, it really is an incredible story, but it's not quite over yet. The head of the Flying Squad, Detective Superintendent Craig Turner, is here with the latest on the elusive Basil. He is an intriguing character. I mean, he seemed to have got them in in the first place. You must be closing in on, on him by now. Well, the uh, purpose of me here today is to uh, uh, appeal to members of the public. We're offering £20,000 for information that leads to the arrest and conviction of the person we call Basil. Um, what we know about Basil is that, obviously, he allowed the group to to enter into the deposit box area via the front door using a key. We think he's wearing a wig, yeah, and we're not too sure whether his name is in fact Basil. The group referred to him as Basil, but we don't think that's his true, true name. Um, he's obviously walked into the Hatton Garden area. He was very, very elusive to CCTV, so therefore he could be local to the area. So we're appealing to members of the public that may have seen anything suspicious on the lead up to the Easter Bank holiday weekend. Because he really did take real sort of pains to disguise himself, didn't he? He did. From the CCTV, he's carrying the uh, case uh, or bag uh, on his shoulders uh, and I would have said he would have known where that CCTV was and would have known the actual area. And they took 14 million pounds worth of property. You've recovered about 4 million, but 10 million still missing. And these are some of the items that you're interested in finding. It is, and uh, we're extremely victim focused. Uh, we've restored 3.7 million pounds worth of jewellery back back to victims. And we're going to take our time to make sure that obviously those items of jewellery get back to the rightful owners. Um, I would appeal to members of the public and also people that are involved in the jewellery industry um, if they're ever offered uh, um, items of jewellery in suspicious circumstances circumstances uh, or bespoke items such as these that will be shown on the website uh, to contact the incident room. Okay. Thank you. And if you think you can help the Flying Squad bag their man, please do get in touch using the numbers on screen. Also, if you've been a victim of any crime, you may want to speak to victim support. They are on 0808 16 89 111.